Welcome, dear listener, to Haunted Tales, your weekly horror anthology, with stories full of ghosts and ghouls, crimes and curses, demons and devils and more. This place kind of creeped her out. Not that it had anything to do with the people living here. Old folks or the ones working, like her mom. But something about this place felt off. The atmosphere was kind of strange. Theodora wondered if it was the same in every retirement home, but doubted it. This place here just felt different. She was walking slowly through the hallway trying to find anything to do when she waited for her mother to end her shift. She spotted a single door standing open with light coming from inside. This felt strange as well. Approaching it quietly somehow seemed like a violation. These rooms were, for all intents and purposes, private domiciles and the old folks living here did deserve their privacy. Theodora stopped her feet before she could even hear or see anything going on in there. was about to turn around as a low voice reached her, coming from the room. You can come in, child. It spoke. I know you're waiting for your mom, and I wouldn't mind the company. She could feel her body freezing, blood shooting up into her cheeks and ears, making them burn, as if she had just been caught doing something naughty. Don't worry, child. I don't bite. The voice continued, and Theodora could see a shadow forming out of the corner of her eyes, as someone moved in the room, coming toward the door. She had been caught. Girl, no. Yet this person didn't seem angry at all. Turning around, she could see a face looking out from the threshold, smiling brightly at her, and Theodora couldn't help but grin sheepishly as well. Come in, come in. I haven't had any visitors in quite some time, and I'd much rather you didn't sneak around the hallways the old woman said, calling her closer with a gesture of her hand. Well, it couldn't hurt, right, spending some time with her? Her mom had told her not to annoy the old folks, but this didn't count, right? The woman had called out to her first and seemed glad to have someone to speak to. Theodora nodded, turned toward her and followed the old woman into the room. It was different from what she had imagined it would look like. There were soft carpets, books, blankets, and pictures on the walls. Shelves filled with trinkets, and even an ornate wooden box carved beautifully. Theodora walked through the room, taking it all in, while the woman sat down in a big, comfy chair and continued following her with her eyes. A small wooden picture frame caught her attention. She couldn't say why, but something about it seemed to draw her in. It was the smallest of the frames here, yet the only one that showed a photograph instead of a painting. I see you found my brother. Theodora heard the old voice coming from behind her, and stopped just short of picking the frame up. Yeah. It was a photograph, all right, but not a modern one. Everything from its coloration to the way that the two children posed in it it screamed that it must be almost ancient. Decades old, it looked like. Almost a hundred years, child, the woman spoke, answering her thoughts. Sit down on the bed. 
I can tell you all about him, about what happened back then. Theodora felt strange as she slowly picked up the small picture frame, sat down and looked at it once more. The two children seemed happy. Their smiles were wide, their eyes bright, as they stared right into the camera. But I have to warn you, it is a dark story. Theodora nodded and forced herself to look away from the picture and at the old woman. The photograph was taken during summer. It was the first time we had seen anyone with a camera, and Hans demanded to be in the picture with me. I can remember his laugh even now, the way he giggled throughout the whole day, asking our parents when we would get to see the photograph. It's not like today, where you can see the picture almost immediately. Back then, developing a photo took time. Well, one week later, the man who had brought the camera gave my parents an envelope. That is the photo you're looking at right now. The first and last one of my brother. And if my memory still serves me well, it might have been the last time that he smiled at all. Theodora could see the woman lowering her head. There were tears in her eyes. And for a moment, she thought about telling her to stop the story. This seemed a bit too raw for the old lady, and she really didn't want to open up old wounds. But before she could even utter a word, the woman raised her head once more, her milky eyes fixating on her again. And what she saw in that face made her swallow everything she had wanted to tell her. She was smiling. Crookedly, and while her lips quivered, the eyes seemed to suddenly fill with rage and hate. Life wasn't as sheltered back then. And I don't mean that as an insult to you young people today. But the fall after this photo had been taken was the worst one my family had ever had to live through. The corn in the fields got this strange black mold. Potatoes that were pulled from the earth were mushy, rotten, and stunk like death. It felt like from one day to the next, the only animals one could see outside were black, evil-looking crows and ravens. I remember it like it was yesterday finding my parents down in the kitchen area, right around sunrise, their faces pale, their eyes puffy, whispering hushed words, yet not daring to look at each other. At first, I thought they were arguing, but their eyes, as they realized I was standing there, were different, more sad, and angry. I tried asking, but neither mother nor father responded to my questions. So I turned to Hans, as he seemed like he had a little bit of an inkling of what was going on around here. It still took a few days for him to open up to me. Maybe he wasn't sure himself. Maybe he wanted to protect me. But he did tell me at night when we knew that our parents would be sleeping. Failed harvests meant hunger back then. And I think he said something about mother getting another child. In hushed tones, he told me about what he had heard from the other people in town. Of what they used to do back in the times of our forefathers. If this winter got cold, people would die. 
If it got particularly bad, the whole town might disappear. He warned me to be on the lookout from then on, and promised to not leave me behind if worse came to worst. I still remember that I couldn't sleep at all at night. Nightmares were plaguing me. I tossed and turned. Yet as the sun rose and I got out of bed, those bad dreams followed me. Mother and father were in the kitchen area again. Yet this time, they weren't talking with each other, but were sitting there in silence, waiting. For me, I think. Hans appeared behind me, his hand on my shoulder, as I saw father looking up, his eyes red like he had been crying for hours. I knew then and there that all the bad things I had imagined were about to come true. And they did. Mother couldn't speak a single word, just kept holding her belly. As father tried to tell us, yet Hans interrupted him almost immediately. I had never seen him this angry before. He screamed and spat words at our father I couldn't imagine hearing him say out loud until then. Yet all the anger in the world didn't change the outcome. We had to leave. Food would be running out, and there were two mouths more to feed. Hans made sure to grab our coats and as much of our clothes as he could carry before dragging me out of the house. Yet, all I could think about was taking the picture with me, the one of us smiling. I can't even remember my mother's voice anymore. She never spoke and did not even dare to look at us as we left. The first cold breeze of the year hit my face just as we walked out of our parents' home for the last time. Strange how some things stick in your mind even decades, almost a century later. Right. Theodora was shaking her head in disbelief. She couldn't even imagine what this old woman sitting there in the comfy chair must have gone through. He didn't dare to speak or ask questions, as she could see her already getting ready to continue her story. I was in a daze for most of the day. At first, I thought Hans would walk to the neighbors and ask for shelter there, but he led me straight out of the town. I only understood his thoughts a few years later. This problem with the harvest had hit the whole town. No one would have food to spare, and taking in two more children was out of the question for anyone. We might have been the first ones to be set loose, and I'm sure there had to be other families as well, pushing out their children to offer them a chance at survival. Hans continued dragging me along, and I remember the tears, mine and his. Both of us knew at that moment that we wouldn't see our parents again. I don't even know how far we got before my mind started working normally again. But when I asked him where we would be going, Hans simply told me, South. That was the direction of the next biggest city. I knew. Even though I had no idea how far we would need to go, or what would happen once we reached our destination. It feels strange saying that now. 
that we did not have a single iota of an idea what we were doing. We had no family besides the parents who had just abandoned us, no place to turn to. Yet Hans seemed so sure, so certain that we should head that way, that I simply followed without question. Theodora could see the old woman smiling softly, sadly, while clasping the armrests of the chair with her old hands. As we reached a small hill on the outskirts of the town, I remember looking back. There was our parents' house. Tiny. Yet it was a sight I had enjoyed time and time again these past years. While sledding down the hill, I had always looked back at them for a moment and wondered what they were up to. But not on that day. I do not recall if I felt anything at all, to be honest. Maybe I wanted to see Mother coming out of the house, running in our direction, calling out to us to take us back in. But it did not happen. Hans grabbed hold of my hand and led me over the hill until my parents' house disappeared from my sight forever. We walked on and on and on. I remember stopping at a stream, washing our faces with what felt like ice-cold water and drinking from it before starting to walk again. Where would we sleep? What could we eat? There were so many questions in my mind, yet the answer always stayed the same. Hans would know. He had a plan, I told myself. Wouldn't abandon me. As the sun already started setting, we finally reached the woods. A forest, big and dark and far enough away that I had never before set foot into it. I remember clasping Hans' hand even more tightly, feeling my stomach growling. Yet I didn't dare to speak a word in protest. It's the quickest way, he told me, even though I didn't ask. He must have thought about the possibility that our parents would throw us out for days. How far did he think I could walk? Those are questions that have never stopped plaguing me since back then. Now, almost one hundred years ago, I wish I could stop. I'll turn back time and tell him not to lead me in there. To walk around the forest and stay far, far away from the one who waited in there. But I didn't. We didn't. Theodora felt completely drawn in by the story. Her hands had started shaking softly, the small picture frame between her fingers now almost forgotten. We walked into the woods, and by God, I remember the light suddenly leaving us almost completely in the dark, and the temperature dropping far more than it should have. This place was bad. I could feel it, somehow even smell it. This strange odor enveloped us as soon as we had entered it. Sickly sweet, like rotten fruit. But Hans didn't care. I do not know if he could not feel it, or if the fear of seeing me starve or freeze to death swallowed up all his other worries. So we headed deeper into the woods. 
trying to cut a straight path through to reach the city as quickly as possible. I... I should have stopped him. A tear was running down the cheek of the old woman. Theodora finally pulled herself out of her stupor. She wanted to say something, to stop the story if it made the old woman so upset. Yet the moment she rose from the bed and stood up, an old gnarled hand shot up and told her to pause. It is all right. I want to tell this story. I feel like I need to tell someone this story. Please bear with me a little bit longer. It was dark in there. Damp. I remember Hans kneeling down beside a tree, picking up some dark moss and small twigs, then growling and letting them drop again. He had his flint with him. I knew. Yet there was no kindling, nothing to set a light or give us warmth or light. I could feel him getting frustrated, could hear it in the noise his steps now made. Stomping on the ground, hitting out at small bushes and vines that seemed to grow thornier the deeper we got into the forest. Hours must have passed, yet all that changed was that the woods surrounding us seemed to get thicker, darker, and less friendly. Finally, Hans told me to stop. I could see it in his eyes, even though it was so dark I could hardly make out anything else. He couldn't go on any longer either, and I was happy that we could stop and rest. There was no shelter around, not even some kind of stony outcrop we could sleep beneath. So Hans gave me three jackets he had brought along and told me to rest next to a tree. It was cold and damp. Something one doesn't realize if you've never spent days outside is that you feel like you will never get dry again. Water seeps into every fabric, pulls out your warmth, and will leave you a shivering bundle sleeping on the ground. The only reason I managed to drift off at all was that I had not slept a night before. But even then, I couldn't fall asleep fully. Because as soon as both Hans and I stopped moving and I drifted off to sleep, the noise returned to the forest surrounding us. The wind was picking up, rustling the leaves around us. Small twigs were breaking close by. I think I could hear someone humming. Every time I woke up, I could see Hans looking at me, his eyes at least partially opened, while the noise of someone walking around us seemed to follow me out of my dreams. It was cold. So cold. I thought I might freeze to death, yet I didn't dare to move around too much. Something inside myself told me to stay exactly where I was, to not make any sound. With the wind still rustling the leaves and bushes surrounding us, the humming I heard seemed to come from everywhere at once. And suddenly, I felt wide awake. A twig broke somewhere in the darkness behind Hans and I could see him flinching. There was movement going on in his back. I could see it as well. A dark shadow, hunched over, was slowly creeping up on him. This time, I was sure it wasn't a dream. 
I hadn't thought of the possibility that we might run into someone else out there and had hoped that Hans would know what to do, but my brother seemed just as terrified as I was. The closer this shadow crept, the more I could see of it. It was human, at least shaped like one. Long rags covered the hunched-over body. There was something thin and hard in its hand. A walking cane. Its head and face were covered by a shawl and hood. I could see it, reaching out with the tip of its cane, touching the ground right behind Hans, and my mind could not take it any more. All the stress, all the fear seemed to explode inside of me in an instant, making me jump up from the cold and damp forest floor and scream my lungs out. The thing stopped for a moment. I could feel it, suddenly staring at me. Its eyes, even though I couldn't see them, locked onto me. There was no doubt in my mind that this thing was bad news. Someone or something that wanted to hurt us, hurt me. It cackled, softly, but I could hear it clearly. This noise, this hunger in it. Hans was lying by the thing's feet, didn't dare to move anything but his eyes. Yet, it did not seem to notice him. Its whole focus was on me, and me alone. I turned, howled, ran into the night and dark forest. And now, this thing wasn't slowly creeping forward anymore. It came after me. I could hear it, wheezing, laughing, chuckling all the while. In my wild panic, I didn't look where I was going. Had to try and dodge the roots and trees. Felt pain every time one of the thorny vines scratched my face and hands. It followed me, easily. I cried and screamed for mother and father, while the thing behind me chuckled in response. Every few steps I could feel it, touching me, shoving me, almost making me fall. Back then, I'm sure you can imagine, I did not think straight anymore. Terror filled my mind. I wasn't sure. What had found us? All that I knew was that it was evil, delighted itself in torturing me. It felt like an eternity had already passed. My legs were completely numb. My lungs burned as I looked back to see if it was still following me. And suddenly my foot stepped into empty space. With a scream, I fell down a slope, heard the thing above coming to a stop and laugh maniacally, while nothing else in this damned forest dared to make a noise. I was sure I would die. This must have been the first time in my life that these kinds of thoughts had found me. In the darkness through which I tumbled, I could feel things moving felt certain that some evil would grab hold of me any moment now, then suddenly hit something hard with my head, and everything seemed to stop. I felt, I dreamed, that I was falling into a black abyss, still screaming. But now my own voice got back to me, sounding like laughter as I tumbled through the endless night. 
It could not have been more than a few seconds until I regained consciousness, but it felt like hours. My head was droning, hurting as I rolled around the wet moss I was lying on and tried to get back up onto my feet. The thing was still there. My mind warned me. I needed to run. Slowly, my sight returned as I stumbled and fell to my knees. Behind me was the slope I had fallen down. Dark and ominous. In front, a clearing with a hut. For a single moment, I allowed myself to stare at it, to wonder what it was doing here in the middle of this forest. It did not fit what I had seen since we had come here. Yet a sudden noise up above and behind me made me move toward the hut. My head was still swimming, and the laughter I could hear back there sounded strange and distorted. This hut would be safe, my childish mind promised. Dumb, right? Theodora could see the old woman shaking, yet her eyes seemed strangely full of life. You can already guess where I was, right? This thing. It could have grabbed me any time. Yet it didn't. I realized it too late back then. Running, stumbling toward the hut, I only had two thoughts on my mind. First, I needed to hide somewhere. Second, I hoped that Hans would find shelter as well and meet me in the morning. The door of the hut stood slightly ajar, and I pushed my way inside without a moment's hesitation. What hit me first was the warmth coming from the dark hut. The air in there was almost hot, felt searing compared to the cold breeze outside. I was walking forward, to the pitch-black interior of the hut, feeling strangely exposed now that I had entered it. Why was it so dark? There were no candles, no lanterns, not even a window. Then, the smell hit me, and suddenly everything clicked into place. It was dark in here, because the owner of this hut couldn't see anyway. The sickly sweet odor that was now filling my mouth and nose. I had been smelling it since coming into this forest. Roasted, burned and rotten fruit. Disgusting. Yet so my hungry mind still pleasing. Soft light suddenly illuminated the dirty wooden floor I was standing on, and I felt myself freezing up. The one who owned this place, who had built it to draw in children, was cackling again. Only this time, it was standing behind me in the open door. Hungry. It wheezed, and before I could turn around, a hand grabbed me by the neck, lifting me off the floor, as the thing rushed in and dragged me through the darkness. I screamed and cried, even louder than before, but this monster didn't stop. It had played around enough, I realized, and just then, it slammed my face into a wall. This thing was completely evil, inhuman. Mad from hunger and whatever else gave it its power. I could see light flashing in the darkness before my eyes, 
felt blood trickling from my nose and heard the thing breathing in deeply, inhaling my scent and the smell of my blood. Leathery lips latched onto my neck, sucked at it as I tried to struggle, and the thing began to cackle once more. Somewhere in the darkness, its cane tapped against the floor and walls, found the door and pushed it open. The odor of sweet fruit got stronger, and flickering light hit my eyes. I could see it, stairs leading down into the ground, a basement where a single object stood. One big wood-burning stove. There was a new smell in the air now, too, of burned flesh and hair. I screamed, and it seemed to delight in my fear, pulling its lips from my skin as it whirled me around and raced toward the stairs. This was when and how I should have died, I knew. Yet something happened even the witch could not foresee. We were at the top of the stairs. I was clinging to the door frame for my life as another scream filled the hut. Hans. I could see his silhouette in the light of the open door. He was racing toward us, screaming, and the witch turned her head just as he jumped. The old strong hand let go of me as Zainbeck pushed her off her feet and she tumbled down the stairs together with my brother. Run! He screamed and howled, and I did. I'm not sure how I got out of the woods, only that it took me until almost sunrise, before I finally broke through the last bit of brush and fell onto the grass beneath the clear blue sky. The thing, the witch, it did not follow me. It let me get away, probably because it was busy. I left my brother back in there to die, saved my own life without hesitation. Theodora wanted to say something, but the woman had her hand raised again, cutting off her words before they could leave her mouth. It took me two more days until I reached the city. I did whatever I could to survive, child. Yet every day I walked around, still looking for a sign of my brother. Clinging to the hope that he would follow me one day, find me, and I could apologize. It did not happen. Forty years passed. Four decades. I learned about them. Even learned of them. And after all those years, I finally returned to those woods. Theodora could feel the ice-cold gaze now squarely resting on her. But this time, the witch didn't see me coming. I caught her, broke her, and dragged her to her hut. Now no longer chuckling, but sobbing and begging. You see, those things are everywhere, all around us. Humans that have stopped being human because of greed. Even in her last moments as I pushed her into her own ever-burning stove, 
I could feel her still struggling, still trying to live just a few seconds longer. Yet I felt nothing. There was no way of knowing which of the bones I found in the hut were from Hans. So I buried them all and took a souvenir. Theodora watched as the raised hand sank down and a finger pointed to one of the shelves where the ornate wooden box stood. The witch took from me, so I took from her. She might have been my first, but definitely not my last. Theodora was up from the bed, and the framed picture fell from her hands as she tried to walk to the door of the room. But the old woman was surprisingly quick on her feet as well. An old hand touched her cheek, softly held her back, as the ancient-looking face came closer and closer to hers, and their eyes met. I can see the same spark in you, child. This greed. Do not go down that road. I might be old, but I think I still have one left in me. Theodora could feel the cold chill crawling up her spine. Those eyes looking into hers weren't lying. The old woman was completely serious. She wanted to scream and run. But just as she reached up to grab hold of the hand still stroking her cheek, a soft knock pulled her attention away. Are you ready, Dora? Her mother's voice reached her, and as if a switch got flipped, all the tension seemed to disappear out of the ancient eyes, and in front of her stood an old, frail lady again. Theodora nodded and could see the old woman smiling, felt her patting her as she pushed past and turned back one last time. Only daring to do so after she had reached her mother. Thanks for looking after my daughter, Margaret, her mom said, and Theodora could see a twinkle in the old woman's eye. No problem. She can come by any time she likes. She's such a well-behaved child, isn't she? Theodora could feel her mother almost rolling her eyes, but didn't dare to look away from the woman in the room. Thankfully, her mom didn't want to stay any longer either, pulled at her softly to get her going, while the old woman smiled and waved one last time. If you want to come and see me, just ask for Gretel at the reception. I'm sure we'll have much to talk about soon. Theodora still felt the chills as her mother led her away along the hallway. She could hear her now. Chuckling inside her room. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed this week's story. If there are any questions, concerns, or cute pet pictures you would like to share with us, there are links to our X, Instagram, Tumblr, and our Buy Me a Coffee in the episode descriptions. All the best to you, and please join us again next week for another haunted tale.